I'm packing up my trail craft boat for another trip up to Kimberley. And 35 years ago, I had an old purling lugger here and I sailed up the coast and I went to an amazing place. And I showed that place in my film, Follow the Sun. And I called it the horizontal waterfall. And I still get phone calls and emails from people all over the world asking me about the horizontal waterfall. So this is my latest trip to this very special part of the Kimberley. Just over here, there's some mullet have just hit the surface feeding. Let's see if I can get one. <laughs> How's that? Very nice mullet. I'll just get my hat. The best way to eat mullet like this is to light a small fire, get them straight onto the coals while they're nice and fresh. There's a few nice oysters here, so I'm going to use an old Aboriginal trick to get myself a feed. I've just collected some spin effects from the rocky country. Now, just light the spin effects in a couple of minutes, it'll cook the oysters. And there we have cooked oysters. Mm. And aren't they sweet? Mm. Mm. And this is where BHP made all their money, at the top end of King Sound on Cockatoo and Coolan Island. You can see here this incredibly pure iron ore. If you get two pieces of it, they tell me that it's so pure, you could just run a weld along here and it will weld together. This is my crocodile alarm dog. See the croc here? Oh, oh, stuck on this high reef waiting for the tide to come in. Just have a quick cup of tea on the old Primus. Once there's enough water across this reef, straight down to the horizontal waterfall. Another hook up. Nice little queenie. Straight back in the water. Oh, look at this. <laughs> now you're talking. Now we're into the that fish. is one of the nicest eating fish in the north. Now we can have a feast for lunch. This hand line is going off. Oh. Here he is. Oh. Lovely spotted cod. Normally I'd keep him. These are delicious to eat, but I've already got about three jack. So yep. popping back in the water. And here comes the tide. And with the tide come the sharks. And in a few minutes, we're off to the horizontal waterfall. I'm just outside the first entrance. You can see it there. This one is quite wide. You've only got about a one and a half to two meter drop here at the moment. The one that we want to see is about another 400 meter through. That's a very narrow one. That's a dangerous one. What I want to do now is kick the motor over, go straight through there, down to the second one. Well, we tried the film coming through there, but the camera just got smashed up, the boat spun around. This really, to me, is one of the most spectacular places in the whole of Australia. Now we've got to go down to the second one. This is early the next morning, and the tide is now coming out. I have never seen anything like this. It's still shadow in there, but there's about a 12, 14 foot, so about a four metre drop. The power in there is unbelievable. It's all quiet now. We're just about to drift through on the change of tide. Just have a look how flat this is. Only three hours ago, the four metre drop there. We're going inside now to film it from in there. So 
that's out. This horizontal waterfall here at Talbot Bay would be one of Australia's greatest natural wonders. We've got 11 and a half metre tide coming in here at the moment. And when you take the boat out in that white water, it is the ultimate adrenaline rush. I've got to be a little bit careful here because I've got a back current taking me down there and it's time for me to get out of here. Heading back to Derby now, but on the way, I've got to pick up a couple of rogue crocodiles. Oh, just have a look at this mackerel. This would be the most remarkable fish that I've ever caught in my 40 years on the Kimberley coast. We're just motoring into the bay here. I saw a huge splash. Some larger fish was chasing this one. This one ended up on the reef. We rushed over. The fish had hit its head. It was stunned on the bommy here. I grabbed a spear and zapped it just before it took off into the water. Quite remarkable. <laughs> now, Bundle, there's our lunch. You've probably noticed in this series that I'm using a very different type of anchor. Well, this is a new design. It's called an anchor right. And the best way to demonstrate it is just take it out here on the sand and I'll show you how it works. You can see here it's got a semicircular piece of steel here. So when you drop it over the bow, and if it hits the ocean like that, as you pull it, it automatically rights itself. If for any reason your anchor is fouled on the bottom, see how it's, I've got it stuck here on the rock? What you do is you drive back over the anchor. Now watch this shackle, see this D shackle? It slides along here, comes back on the anchor and it pulls out. I have to check the area here for crocodiles before I pull the boat out. Now, to catch these crocs, I've just got a long bamboo pole here and a very small harpoon that just goes in the end of the bamboo there, just like so. With the spotlight, we can pick up the eyes of the croc and when we get close, it's straight into the shoulder of the croc. This is the tricky part. We've got the harpoon in, and we've just got to play this croc around. It's taking off again. Pull too hard though. The harpoon may come out. I've just got this rope on the top jaw. Right, pull it tight. Right over right, now. Right, right. Yeah, the old crocodile alarm has gone off again. Hey, croc. Yeah. Here. All I have to do is quickly tie these jaws together, See, like this with this tape, and I'll be, able to, I'll be able to lift her into the boat. Now this is not a big croc, but it's deemed to be a problem animal, and if I don't take it back to the farm, someone's going to shoot it, so poor old crocodile doesn't have much option. It's either a bullet, well, back to my crocodile park. Next is to make the scones I've been talking about. So it's two cups of self-raising flour and when it's sivered, that aerates the flour, makes the scones a lot lighter. That, about a quarter of a teaspoon of salt. Now out here we don't have a teaspoon, so that's about a quarter of a teaspoon. And milk, right on. Now about a cup of milk, so I've got powdered milk, so we just drop that in there. That's about a cup full. Right on. Now, we don't always have this luxury out in the bush. The butter, so I've got melted butter. To make really good scones, you do need the butter. Right, we drop that in there. Now, a little bit of a bonus. Put some sultanas in there. There we are. Because it was powdered milk, I have to add some water. Yes, warm water. 
Mix it up for a minute or two. Dry flour out on the table. Put the mix in the in onto that flour. Just knead it up just lightly. Just a little oil in the bottom of the camp oven. And it's best to preheat the camp oven so it's nice and hot. Just put the lid back on and I'll cut up these scones. Into the camp oven. Little bush brush and I'm just going to glaze the top of these scones onto the coals for about 10 to 15 minutes. How's that for a good batch of scones? Cup of tea time. Take it away. When you're out in the bush for weeks at a time, it's often really good to have something different, something a little bit sweeter. So what I'm gonna make up here is a nut and raisin cake. And this one's particularly good for the bush because you don't need eggs and you don't need butter. Right, the first thing is flour, two cups of flour. A tablespoon of caster sugar. A small quantity of mixed spices, mix it in there. Now I'm gonna add the sultanas and the raisins. Just break them up. In they go. Small cup of warm milk, and I'm using powdered milk out in the bush, and around about a tablespoonful of golden syrup. That's only a dessert spoon. Mix it all up and add it into the mixture. There we are. Stir it up. I'll put it on the coals for about 40 minutes. The nut and fruit cake should be ready, so let's have a look. Just take the lid off. Well, that looks pretty good to me. A really good way to knock up a feed in the bush is what I call my version of a Johnny cake. A couple of cups of self-raising flour in a container, bit of salt, some milk, dry milk out in the bush, and a few sultanas if you like. You don't have to put the sultanas in and make a real sloppy mix. And that's just about ready to pour into the frying pan. Plenty of oil. This is the only disadvantage of cooking like this is you need a fair bit of oil out in the bush. Get the oil fairly hot, keep it away from the flame and just pour your mixture in there, right round. When that's cooked underneath, I've got to turn it over. A Little bit of golden syrup and that is a really good snack. Now, if you don't particularly enjoy making your bread in a camp oven on the open fire, this could be the answer. We've got here a bread maker, only a small machine. Now, to drive it, we need an inverter. This is a 600 watt inverter. All I have to do is connect up to the 12 volt, onto the positive and the negative. Now, this little box here will convert the 12 volt to 240. Oh, this looks pretty good. Easy baked bread mix. Pumpkin and chives. Right, so it's just a cup of water into there. It's about one and a quarter teaspoons of yeast in there and three cups of flour. 
One of the great advantages of working out in the bush, of course, if you drop anything on the floor, on the ground, you don't have to worry about sweeping it up. Right. There's our third one. And there. Make sure that that's down. Close it. Switch it on. Selection here. Just away we go. And come back in three hours, we'll have a perfect loaf of bread. These bread makers do draw quite a bit of power, so you have to be very careful that you don't flatten your battery. So about every half an hour, just start your motor for four or five minutes, idle it, make sure when you're finished, that your battery's not down. What about that? I'm heading into the Payne Fine Gold Battery. And the lady friend of mine here, Elaine, she really is an endangered character. In fact, she's the only woman in Australia that works a gold battery. A gold battery is basically where they smash up the rock to get the gold out. Not only is Elaine an endangered character, this is virtually the last of the old gold batteries that's still working in the whole of Australia. How's it going? Oh, flat Good out. Good to see you. Hey, flat out? Yeah. Yeah, you busy? <laughs> yes, yeah? always busy. You want a bit of crushing? Yes, yep, hey? yep. Oh, that's better. Yeah, now you can hear me. Hear <laughs> yeah. Now, Elaine, there's not a lot of people running batteries but you'd be the only woman in Australia running a gold battery, wouldn't you? Yes, I am. Batteries were always run by the government, and when we bought the battery back in 1987, um, I had to learn to run it, but I had my father to show me how to run it. You either crush your own rock from your own mine... Yes. ..or if people come in, they can hire it, and you crush the rock for them? I crush them their rock on an hourly basis. And what do you do first? You tip it into that big bin up the back there? Yes, they come in, they bring a truckload of ore, they tip yeah. it into the bin, start it up, the rock goes through the crusher, it breaks it up to whatever size you want, and yeah. then we send it up to conveyor into a second bin, which is the same size as the top bin. And from the top bin, it feeds itself, self-feeding down to the bottom to where the stamps are, it goes in a little tiny bin down below and crushes, goes into the stamps. So you've got these great big long arms going up and down, up and down, and they're basically smashing up the rock, aren't they, into yes. a powder? You must watch it the whole time. Yeah. And that's very important to watch your feed, watch your water, because if it's not there, you could smash it up. I mean, it's hard work. I'm a prospector. Yes. I come in with, say, a hundred tonne of rock. How much gold would I have to get out of a hundred tonne of rock to make it worthwhile? Well, you'd need at least 12 grams to the tonne. 12 grams to the yes, tonne. Yes, le at yeah. least. So if I came in with rock that was sort of, had two or three ounces in it, I'd be rich, would I? If I had a secret... <laughs> you'd be rich. Yeah. You'd two or three ounces rich. of gold oh. per tonne of rock. Well, that'd be two or three hundred ounces, wouldn't it? That'd be fantastic. Which is about $150,000. Yeah. Wow. So once the rock is a nice fine powder, yes. it goes into the box yes. and you squirt water through there and do you do anything else? Yes, we, every hour we put mercury in the box and while it's churning up and down, the mercury amalgamates the big gold, which stays in the box. Right. And then only the very, very fine gold is forced out through that screen with the water. The pressure yeah. of the water forces out the very fine gold. And then it goes out onto that big table. Yes, and that table is a copper plate which we coat with mercury. The reason we do that is that mercury sticks to copper, gold sticks to mercury. 
I learned this at school and I never knew why. <laughs> now I know why if you ever have a gold battery. Do you get a real rush of adrenaline when you can start to see those little flecks of oh, gold on the does, table? It does, yes, and you're hoping and hoping there's more to come. Yeah. <laughs> and the big piece of gold, they stay behind that screen yeah. until we finish crushing. And how do you get the gold off the table? We scrape it up with rubber scrapers yeah. and then we put it into a bowl and then I put a calico cloth and which I, or a chamois cloth which I squeeze out and make into balls of amalgam. What's By squeezing, amalgam? What's amalgam? Amalgam is gold and mercury mixed together. Oh, because the mercury's it's hanging onto that gold. gold. And then normally that a ball of amalgam is roughly 50% gold, 50% mercury. And then once we, once we do that, we then put the amalgam balls into yeah. a retort pot. You put clay all around the top of it and smear it. Put the little uh, bolts in and tap them on so make sure it's tight. And then we take it outside, we put it on the fire. There's a little water tube there. Attach a hose to that. The mercury, once it gets hot enough, it vaporises up through that pipe and as it comes down, it gets to the water tube area, then it condenses back into liquid form. So once all the mercury comes out, you open up that retort pot, and in there should be your gold cake. Now we put all this gold here into this little shovel. And then once you get the gold cake out, you yeah. put it into a crucible yeah. with a handful of borax. Yeah. Now the borax is a cleaning agent. You then light your little furnace up, which yeah. consists of diesel and electric fan, and you must have 1100 degree heat to melt the gold. And depending on the amount of gold, it'll take roughly 30 to 40 minutes to melt. Yeah, and then right. once it's melted, we pour it into a mould and let it cool down, which yep. takes a couple of minutes for the uh, slag to set. Once the slag's set, I tip it out, tap the slag off, and then you tip it in acid and water to clean the gold. Now it's in water, and cool it down. Ah, oh, geez, that looks pretty good. And there's the end result of a lot of hard work. That's called the primary bar, and that'll go straight down from here to the vault at the Perth Mint. How much is gold worth these days? Gold at the moment is around about 560 Australian dollars. For what? Uh, an ounce. For an ounce. Yes. Yeah. That's a lot of money, isn't it? A lot of hard work. Too. Yeah, a lot of hard work, that's right. Yeah. A lot of people go broke, don't they? They do, because gold is a lot of expense in mining. Now, you do a little bit of prospecting as well, don't you? Yes, I, I go out and metal detect. Yeah. And sometimes I find petrol money, sometimes I find a bit better. Something, something, something there. there. Something there. Something down here, where? Yes, something what, there. What, in about this area here? Yeah, yeah. Oh. Yeah. I wouldn't know. Yeah, round about here. Yeah. Can I just have a listen? Yep. What, yeah. I can hear that. It's a funny noise. It's fairly big. Oh no, back here further. And I'll go over the dirt. Is that no, something? No, you, no. You just keep detecting for it. Yeah, yeah. It's big. Oh. There it is. Yeah. Oh. Is that gold? Oh, oh, oh yes. Hey? Where is it? That's Give me a nice. look. <laughs> Are you fatty? <laughs> you can see it here, there now, look. Hey, that's all that, that's, that's gold. All gold. But it's not a whole lump of gold, it's only, what's that in, a bit of quartz? Oh, that's made my day. I've just pulled up on the Arnhem Highway. Have a look at the map. Now, Darwin down there to the west, up here, you've got Jabiru, Kakadu National Park, and Arnhem Land further over to the east. Now, that way out here on the coast is a place called Alco Island. I lived out there many years ago. So what I'm going to do now is drive out through Kakadu, central Arnhem Land, meet a barge in a few days, go across, see my old mates at Alco Island. Should be a great trip. I'm just going to turn off the highway down here 
friend of mine has got a most unusual pet, and I want to show him to you. Yeah, mate. Hey, you still got that amazing animal there? Yeah. How you going? This is Pig. How you going, Pig? Hey, mate. How are you? Hey, come to me. <laughs> come here. Hey. He's the most docile animal that you could ever come across. Come here, pig, and I'll get you something to eat. There you go, pig. Hey. Just look at this. I never learned, do I? Went away to have a look around the farm, come back, and pig has been into my tucker bag. Look at the golden syrup all chewed up. And the Powerade, look what he's done to that. Wrecked it. And uh, have a look at my Milo tin. Absolutely no Milo left. See what he's done with his tusk, trying to open it up? And here's Pig. It sounds like he's suffering from severe indigestion after ransacking our camp. I've just come off the Arnhem Highway by about 50 k's. I've come to a place called Shady Camp. On the right here, that's all salt water. They've built a barrage here. So beyond the barrage, it's all fresh water. I've hired a dinghy, and this is one of the best places to see big saltwater crocs. And this is what the big crocodiles are after, these cattle in here. These are all stations privately owned. There's been five head of cattle taken here just in the last two or three weeks. I've called in at Shady Camp for a couple of reasons. One is to see the really big crocs, of course. And the other reason is I love these gigantic lotus lilies. And just after they flowered, they seed. And in here, you have the seed, see them there, see that? That's very sweet, just like a pea. Mm. Always good for a lunchtime snack. If you lose your hat and you're in amongst the lotus lilies, there's one there, isn't that perfect? All these large salties, these large saltwater crocs, like the one behind me, are in fresh water. So just because they're called saltwater crocodiles, don't think you only find them in salt water. In fact, you find the biggest population of big crocs in fresh water, because there's more food here. Just on the other side of the billabong, on my left is a massive croc, at least 16 foot, over five meters. See over here? That whopping great big croc there, that's the sort of crocs that will take those cattle. Become very overcast. It feels like rain. The mosquitoes are out. I've got the long pants on. So I'm going to go for a walk. See what I can find. For over 100 years, this country east of Darwin was called the Buffalo Plains. It was overrun with the Asian buffalo when they were introduced in the early days of European settlement. They're now shot out because they're an ecological disaster and also a threat to the cattle industry because they carry disease. Every now and then, you can still see small mobs of them just over here. Most of the time they move off, but you've got to be very wary of them because every now and then they will charge. And one of the most common birds around the edge of the billabongs are these whistling ducks. They pack along the edges by the thousands. And the old croc's got plenty of patience. He just waits and waits and waits. And every now and then, bang, he's got one. See, there's one there eating one now. I'm now in the heart of Kakadu, and this is Obiri Rock right here. 
And the view behind me was made famous by none other than Paul Hogan in the movie Crocodile Dundee. East of here is Arnhem Land, and that's where I'm heading in the morning. As you can see, you don't come into Arnhem Land without a permit. I'm now in central Arnhem Land at a place called Ramanginning, and this is the centre of art and culture in Arnhem Land. Just have a look around this building, have a look at all this magnificent art. Normally, these paintings are painted on bark, but it's the wrong time of the year, so now, for convenience, you can get a traditional painting on canvas. See that? So it's a lot easier to transport it. So if anyone is interested in this artwork here, perhaps the easiest way is to contact me on my web page or just write to me at the Crocodile Park at Broome. And this is what brought me to Arnhem Land over 40 years ago, to work with the Aboriginal people. And they're going to have a cattle station here, so we built these stockyards in the bush. And this is where I shot my first film, started here, across the top. I'm a little bit sad because the cattle station is gone and the stockyards are burnt out. Just memories for me now, but anyway, I'm heading for Alcohol Island, so from here I'll drive down to the barge landing. that if you break down into the Australian outback, you get plastic bags and you put them over the trees and you get water. Well, that's partly true, but if you have small plastic bags like these ones here, they're absolutely no use whatsoever. What you have to do is prepare yourself for the trip. So before you leave home, you have to pack at least a dozen very large bags. See this one here? Very heavy duty. And this is a secret of survival in the desert. But what I want to do today is to show you how you get water from the trees around. Like, see these branches here? We've got to get the water out of those leaves into this bag. Now, years ago, we used to just hang a plastic bag over a section of the tree. That's not bad. But a mate of mine's come up with an idea, and it works brilliantly that you put the bag right over the sapling. So what I'm doing is just pulling the sapling together a little bit with some tape, and that'll make it easier for me to put the bag over the top. Now, for those people that are concerned about the tree, this tree will survive after I've finished collecting the water. Once the plastic bag's right over the tree, the next thing is to seal it completely around the trunk here. This is very important. With the plastic bag right over this small sapling, you're gonna collect all the water from these leaves. And this tree acts like a pump. It's actually pulling water out of the ground. So this way you're gonna collect a lot more water. I'm just going to use this log here to get it nice and low so the water will run down into the bag there. Now, you do this early morning and you leave it all day. Around about sundown, you could have anything from a litre to two litres of water in the bottom of that plastic bag. Now this plastic bag's only been on here for three or four minutes. You can already see here, the water starting to condense on the inside of the bag. 
You can see I've got quite a few of these plastic bags from yesterday spread around the bush. You need about 10 or a dozen of these to survive in a hot, arid environment because you've actually got to collect at least, I'll say, eight or 10 litres of water to survive. Look at all that water. Now this one hasn't been set up very well. You notice there's a lot of water collecting here. So I'm just going to tip that down there. You're going to be very tempted during the day to get this water out of here. It's best to leave your bag working all day. But if you really want to get that water out, I'll show you how you can do it. I've tied this bag off here so there's no leaves polluting the water. And what I've done is put a long plastic hose down there. And all I have to do now if I want to drink is just suck it up. Mmm, that's lovely and sweet. You may be concerned about toxins in the water. So what I suggest is you suck a little bit out. Don't swallow it. Just let it go on your tongue here. Wait a few minutes. If there's any stinging sensations, don't use this particular type of tree. If it tastes nice and sweet, like this water does, swallow it down. Wait about an hour, an hour and a half to make sure you don't have any bad reactions to it. If all sweet after an hour and a half, go for it. There is another way to get water out of the ground and out of plants, and that's to make a solar still. Now, solar still needs a lot more energy, and it's probably not as quite as efficient as the bags over the tree, but it's worth knowing how to do it. So what I need is a hole around about a metre in diameter there, and about half a metre deep. The advantage of this still is that you can use salt water, filthy, dirty, fresh water. You can even use urine. So I'll go and put this in the still. Once I've got the hole dug, I've got to get the water in here and all my leaves. Now, I've just picked up a couple of pieces of old plastic. I'm going to line the bottom of the hole with this and a bag here to hold the water. And then I'm going to put all the leaves in right round on top of that. Now we'll just put my water in the plastic. The last thing I do before I put the plastic over the top of this is to place some sort of container in the hole to catch all the condensation. The next step is to put the plastic right over the hole and seal it in. This is the vital part, is to put a stone at the last point over the container. And you don't want too much of an angle on your plastic, and the idea is that as the condensation forms, it'll run down here and drip into the billy can. To make enough water to survive, you'd need quite a few of these. And you certainly don't want to do it in the middle of the day when it's really hot. Do it at night or first light when it's nice and cool so you're not sweating too much. Hmm. That's pretty good. There's about half a litre in there. So, if you're going to survive out here, as I said earlier, you'd need quite a few of these. Now, this is one of the joys of living on a crocodile farm. Baby crocodiles hatching out of the egg. These crocs are incubated at 32 degrees Celsius, so they're all males. Right on the tip of the nose, they have a little egg tooth. So they use that to push through the inner and outer shell, and then they just pop out of the egg. 
I've seen this thousands of times, and every time I see it, I get just as excited. And now that's the miniature adult crocodile into the water. Many of the hatchlings come straight out of the egg, fighting and biting. This is one of my very special mates. I've got a breeding colony here of northern quolls. These come out of the country just near Kakadu. They're extinct there now. In a matter of months, the cane toad has arrived. These little guys grab the cane toads. They die an agonising death in a matter of five to ten minutes. So, under special licence, a certain number have been trapped. And I'm one of the lucky ones to be able to start a breeding colony of them. Very special animals. See you next week. Thank you.